then um, I live in Wiltshire. I've got two boys who are 10 and 7, I think. And, and I guess my journey into sort of sustainable living started, we spent a year buying, I think, new, about six years ago now, um, which just really opened my eyes to all things consumption, conscious or unconscious. Um, and I think had really stopped and thought about what I was buying and why I was buying it and where I was buying it from before. And it just really, having that stop gap between wanting something and buying, being able to buy it, gave me the space to sort of think about all those things and um, really, yeah, just opened my eyes to how unsustainable our consumption is. Um, so I think um, I'm here for the sort of consumer um, aspect or the, you know, I'm really big into what we can all do as individuals to combat to, to help things like fast fashion, climate change, and about the fact that it doesn't have to be perfect. So I have no, um, well, I don't have an aspiration to be plastic free or zero waste, but those things seem really unattainable to me. Um, but that doesn't mean that I can't take lots of steps towards it, and that doesn't mean that I can't make you know, changes to my wardrobe and changes to the way we shop and all those sorts of things. So I feel on the podcast about all things sort of sustainable ish. So, yeah. Just that's the platform. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's all about age. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm Sabrina Bergman, I'm a journalist, I'm freelance, um, I write about all sorts of things, um, but kind of the way that I describe the kind of journalism that I do is that I'm really passionate about questioning anything that most people take for granted. Um, so I think the reason that I was invited was that <laughs> last year I wrote a piece um, for The Independent uh, about the cult of Christmas, why it needs to end, why it's really problematic. Um, it wasn't well received. Um, interesting side note, I'd actually been pitching that opinion piece for about three years. Um, every year, come up to Christmas, I'd send it out to a bunch of publications, no one wanted it. Um, and eventually, last year, it just came up in conversation with my editor at the end of the year. She was like, yeah, write it. Um, and yeah, it was, it was quite controversial, as are quite a lot of things I write. Um, I'm really passionate about sustainability. I run a newsletter about sustainable fashion. Um, and I write a lot of things around different kind of areas where we can be more sustainable, and I think that the intersection between environmental sustainability and questioning consumerism as a kind of basis for a lot of our cultural norms is really important, so that's kind of what I'm looking forward to chatting about today. Good to see you. <laughs> um, I'm Ali Clifford, and um, I have Alter Ego, which is incredibly busy, which is what I've used on social media, and that's what my blog is. But ultimately, um, I work with sustainable brands and ethical brands and independent small businesses to help them build their social media and meet other like minded brands that might want to work with them. Um, I've also got two boys who are teenagers, <laughs> and uh, it's quite hard. I don't know if girls would be different, but boys are quite hard to kind of convince not to go down the fast fashion route. So that's, I think, going to be quite challenging in that one. Yeah. And I probably, if I sort of go back, so despite the 16, um, I was working for House of Fraser. <coughs> say that? Um, I ran their design studio and um, we bought loads of print. And I think it sort of started then where I was thinking, oh my god, we're buying all this paper. So I try to kind of, you know, direct them into a more eco way of buying print and producing graphics and that sort of thing and, and packaging. Um, I run the print and packaging department in terms of signage. Um, and then I met Jill Barker, who started Green Baby. I don't know if people know her. She, kind of, she was kind of one of the first brands to bring real nappies back from the 60s through the 70s. Excuse me. Amazing woman, really inspirational, great person to work with. So I went and worked with her for a few years, um, and she has uh, organic and um, fair trade products, skincare, baby clothes, and kids' clothes. So it was kind of my intro into finding my way in social media because it was kind of cheap, stroke free, even though it was my time. Um, it was a way of doing marketing back then whatever that was, um, which is kind of, and then I sort of tumbled into meeting all these really lovely brands that I work with now, and they're great, I love it, I'm really lucky. Amazing, so that is a little introduction. It's much better if I introduced you, because I, I would just have one sentence, one sentence. <laughs> <laughs> it's always the best way. Yeah, it's really 
rambling on. But it is the best way of doing it. Uh, I just wanted to ask Jen first, so because you haven't got anything for a year. Yes, we do buy anything new for years. New for a year, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, that, like, so my question is about Christmas. How you survived Christmas without yeah. buying anything for a year, like anything new, yeah, in a Christmas moment. And uh, what kind of new influence or like what new skills do you gain through this experience? Mm. Yeah. So we randomly started our year in. September because I was too impatient to wait until the new year and so Christmas came up quite early um, and I already knew I was going to make, I called our year um, my mate to amend year so the idea was we were making we were amending, we were making do with what we had um, and so I already had this idea I was going to make kind of probably a significant proportion of the things we were going to gift but I have a thing about Christmas and um, my excuses for children, but like I really don't like getting too Christmassy before or doing anything Christmassy before the first of December. Otherwise, the excitement levels for the children is just very difficult to maintain without lots of tantrums. <laughs> and um, so I, I then waited until the first of December before like trying to make any gifts. I also decided we wanted to make the Christmas tree um, and to make most of the decorations. So it was quite stressful. <laughs> um, we made the most underwhelming Christmas tree ever out of the egg boxes, having seen this gorgeous one on Pinterest that looked amazing and then we did ours and it was much less amazing um, and I think I was probably lucky because the kids were young enough, they were like four and two, just to accept what, you know, they didn't really question anything, so they didn't question the fact that in their stockings there were things that blatantly I'd made, like um, there's a really easy fudge recipe that my jelly does that's basically like condensed cream and chocolate and make it, and then I just like roll it into little balls so they were radio clear and it goes back. And I did oh, some little homemade bath bombs and had this disastrous attempt at making them hats. Um, and again, I blame Pinterest for a lot of things. Um, I'd seen these dino hats on Pinterest and was trying to make them. And I don't know how I got away with it, but I was like, boys, I just need to measure your hair. This is like one morning at breakfast. And they just um, and made these hats, and then like the only thing that would fit was one of their teddies, and you know we just spent loads of time making it. And so it was, um, and I look, I made quite a lot of presents for friends and family. We had, I say we, I made my husband have that conversation with his um, his side of the family, whereby we said, okay, we're just going to buy for grown ups from now on, not for grown ups. That's really mean. We're just going to buy for the kids from now on, and not for the grown ups. Um, so that cut down on the kind of workload because we got into this really stupid Amazon voucher swap where they'd kind of go, what do you want? No. But Amazon voucher, yes. And then we'd feel guilty because there's really more offer than they give us. Um, so, so we did sort of cut our gift list quite a lot. And then I made quite a lot of gifts. But in hindsight, I'm not that good at sewing. And I probably like a lot of them were really quite crap. And I, I would like to apologise to my family. Um, so now, like we're not um, sort of bound by these rules anymore, but we're still very conscious about what we buy at Christmas and things at all the time. Um, but I've decided I'm much better baker, so I will bake lots of things now rather than so disastrously. Um, chutneys. Chutneys, yeah. Anything you can batch, batch make or bake, I think is great because I would so much rather spend an afternoon, you know, how he takes the kids off or they're watching a film or something, I'll get the kitchen to myself and I can spend an afternoon baking or something with the radio on rather than back on my way around the shops because I'm not a great shopper and there was a second part of my house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so it's more like an ish solution rather than being uh, radical of not buying anything. Yeah, else. yeah, so, so the kids got, um, um, they're quite used to the fact that like Lego doesn't come in a box, it doesn't yeah. necessarily come with instructions and there's a whole section on the Lego website where you just type in the number of the Lego set and get download the instructions. So they're quite kind of used to things like that and used to they, I think this will, I, my anticipation is it will change as they get older and that, you know, I, I think probably certainly in the teenage years there was a bit of a stigma for teens around buying things second hand and stuff, so I don't know how, um, how we will manage that. Um, but no, I mean, they get the obligatory kind of pants and socks, but we get them from um, Prudy and places like that when they're sort of ethically produced. Um, so yeah, now it's just much more about that awareness of um, just those questions, you know, just like, well, if I, I know if I'm, I haven't got anything on fashion wise from the high street since that, you know, buying I think new because I just can't 
but you know, I can't in all conscience, having learned what I learned and now know what I know about the fast, the fast fashion industry, go and buy something and, and my the way sort of I manage it in my head is, you know, if I'm buying that, I'm condoning those practices. I'm saying that, that that's okay and that actually my kids can have um, like they can do super um, school uniform offers like everything you need for like a five or a ten or something and and, I, and if I'm buying that, I'm saying that that's okay for someone else's child to have maybe had to make that, and that doesn't really sit very well with me. So what do you do for school uniform? We're really lucky. We've got um, our PTA run a second-hand uniform thing, so everything's like if people donate stuff, then everything's like a pound. So yeah, we've been really lucky with that. But I don't know, secondary school's going to be different. Kind of fish. Yeah. Yeah, it's been recycled. We've had hand-me-down, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yes. So I've got a question for Ali now. Because uh, <laughs> uh, social media are often used to really sell and promote things, yeah. and uh, especially over the Christmas period, because there's like the overconsumption, or the overconsumption tendency is even higher than the Christmas. And uh, but also social media can serve as a brilliant tool to promote the ideas. Yeah. And I just want to ask you how important is a brand role in a brand role in a promoting sustainability, but also. What is actually sustainable Christmas content if it is anyway about selling? Yeah. How are you kind of yeah, I've I, I, um, I chatted actually with um, Just Trade, Sophie <laughs> from Just Trade today about this. Um, we were chatting about you know what what a, they're a small jewellery brand and she was saying obviously they've still got to sell stuff because yeah. they've got communities that they work with that benefit from extra sales obviously but um, so her suggestion which actually uh, I would also suggest would be she writes uh, like a Christmas blog of other gift ideas so she brings in um, ideas from other brands so she's introducing her current customers and her newsletter database to other ethical brands and it's a really sort of nice sort of altruistic way of kind of going about uh, Still promoting yourself, but obviously promoting other people as well. So it's more about like there's this one sentence that involves with your money. So it's more of a kind of using the power to yeah. power. Mm. Actually, something else that was obviously with Black Friday yeah. being the time when everyone is always buying their Christmas presents. Uh, with Posu, who are an ethical shoe brand that I work with, they um, well we sort of worked on this uh, premise of the Green Friday rather than Black Friday, and we. Um, sold it in as a kind of uh, be more conscious about what you're buying, more mindful, and um, we used um, Facebook marketing mm -hmm. to um, approach lots of people that potentially weren't our customers but now have become our customers. So we're using our customers to spread the word about um, ethical and sustainable. And I, you know, we talked, we had a, we wrote a blog post about. The materials that mm -hmm. uh, you know went into make this is um, the inside of the shoe. It's made of coconut coil and rubber. <coughs> it's very comfy. And I'm wearing them. Yes. I'm wearing them. <laughs> Cozy. Um, so yeah, so it was more about kind of informing people at the same time as you know, Green Friday. Mm -hmm. it, was, uh, it worked really well for us. I'm so really you, pleased with that. Yeah. So you use marketing more as a well, educational is really yeah, like well, good because people some people don't want to be ed like don't want to be educated by brands because it just I've heard I I've heard that it's a pejorative thing but it's just you don't need to educate eh? no <laughs> but inform yes that is a good yeah, yeah. Of saying it. yeah and I'd like to think that we picked yeah. up on quite a few new customers who hopefully will spread the word about how great their shoes are yeah. I'd hope um, another thing that um, there's a, a hashtag. Monday, which you can know about Ethical Hour, and they did a um, shop ethical instead, was their hashtag, mm -hmm. and that's uh, one of my other clients got on board with that. And it was, um, well, it's not exactly what it says on the tin, really, but it, what, what's really nice about that network is that you're, although you are kind of preaching to the converted within that mm -hmm. sort of small pocket of people using the Ethical Hour hashtag, um, it's just another sort of talking point, really, and it's another conversation piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really, I really like the idea that you can kind of kind of empower the communities through your buy because it just it's it's almost like more you buy, more you help. Yeah, and then in a in a certain sense, and then 
Black Friday wouldn't be that much of a problem if we support charities no, no, absolutely. with Black yeah. Friday money. Yeah. So, yes. Yes. so that kind of that kind of marketing would be actually very, very helpful. Um, but it's just my personal opinion. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I've got a question for Serena as well. So in your article <laughs> that you mentioned before, uh, you raise some questions around the common perception perception of uh, December celebrations. Quite a few. <laughs> Non-denominational uh, winter holiday is my preferred term. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Happy non-denominational yeah. winter holiday. That's what it says on my card. <laughs> Carry on. So what are the important things that we should really notice when it comes to Christmas that we like kind of not really get used to? So my issue with Christmas has always come from the social stigma around doing anything other than what is considered the norm, right? And I think it's hugely problematic because the idea that we have of what is supposed to be an ideal Christmas is only available to people with a huge amount of privilege. So you have to have a family, a family you get on with, who is nearby, who have enough money to provide turkeys, to provide presents, to provide trees, who come from a, if not Christian, then semi-Christian, agnostic-ish enough background um, you need to have access to transport, you need to have a job that doesn't require you to work during that period. It's a lot of things that we require people to have in order to attain what is promoted as a baseline of normality. And I think that is hugely problematic. I think a lot of people don't have the relationship with Christmas that we've been told that we should have, and that the media as a whole, and I don't like blaming the media for things, but in this case I think the media and also brands have really pushed on us. Why? Because it helps them sell stuff, right? So Christmas, I don't like the fact that it stems from a um, organised religion, personally. Um, and I know that people will say that's not what it's about now, but that's still where it comes from and I don't like it for that reason. Um, and it's, it's also now more about buying stuff than anything else. Yeah. And for me personally, this sounds radical to some people, to other people it sounds like common sense, like you do you, but the way I see it, I don't like being treated like a funnel for money laundering. And when you're getting paid for your labour by huge corporations, that most of which are not 100% level, because when you get to a certain level, you cannot be, and that money is funneling through you and into other massive corporations that you're spending on, to me, that's really problematic, and I just don't want to be a part of that. Um, there's a huge amount of waste that goes into Christmas. There's a huge amount of discrimination. There's people, you know, who are displaced. One of the things that I quote in my piece that I only discovered one Christmas that um, I decided to volunteer at homeless shelter. Turns out, homeless shelters are booked up to volunteer by July. That's how many people there are, at least in London, that have nowhere to go. I mean, some of them might be doing it for purely altruistic reasons, but however you look at it. One reason or another, they do not have the opportunity or do not want to engage with what is considered a simple family Christmas. Bearing that in mind, how is that still a thing? How is it that the whole country shuts down on this one day? There is no other occasion like it over the course of the year. To me, that is a real problem and something we need to address. We cannot, as a society, encourage this cult around this one day when we know that so many people don't buy into it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> do you do you do Christmas? Do you do presents? Do you? It, I've done loads of different things oh. over the years. Um, so all the past ten years have really been home Christmas. Right. My mum doesn't ask me anymore. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she's given up. She's like, yes, we're not home every time. Um, I've done different things. I understand social norms. Um, I actually is the one who really likes giving gifts. Mm -hmm. Um, and I put a lot of thought into my gifts, I do a lot of homemade gifts, always have, I was brought up with the idea that the most important thing is if you put loads of effort into it, which is stressful and problematic in itself because that involves having a lot of free time. I'm not everyone's that creative, I'm not. And then it's crap. And it's, <laughs> yeah, and it's not ideal. Um, but I do like giving gifts, but I really like removing the pressure. So with my family, a lot of my family are abroad, I don't see them necessarily around this time. So whenever I do see them, Perhaps I'll give them a gift, but it's not necessarily a Christmas gift that has to come on that one day in that one context. Um, with my partner, we don't do Christmas gifts. It's his birthday, we days before Christmas anyway, so we just don't do that. I like the idea of secret Santas if you really want them to open because you've been brought up with that idea. 
But if I could completely avoid gifts around Christmas, I really would. I think if you look at Thanksgiving in America, it's a much bigger holiday than Christmas is in many ways. Um, and it's problematic, I know, in, in a lot of ways. But they've managed to create this sense of community and love and giving and family that everyone says Christmas is about, and they do it without gifts. So I think that's something to look for when we consider gift giving as a core part of Christmas. It doesn't have to be if really Christmas is about what we say it is. Yeah, I, uh, now I just want to, I'm going to ask about our power as individuals in many different ways. We can ask, uh, starting from Jen, because sustainable issues are really, yeah, I hope you're not going to get offended. Down to the earth, uh, classroom. Uh -huh. In a way that, like, it's uh, just for ordinary people, for yeah. everyone. Yeah. Uh, so it's about empowering everyone to make small tweaks and changes that make a difference. Uh, so, what are the top things, like the, the days that would improve what we can do as individuals and a day together without too much effort to improve this? I mean, I think there are loads of little things we can all do. The biggest, biggest thing, and everybody was says to me, like, what, what did you learn from? What did you take away from that year by year? And the biggest thing I took away was that um, sense of power as an individual and the power that our choices have. So um, I think you alluded to it. There's a quote, um, Anna Lappy, about um, every time you open your, your wallet, you're casting vote for the kind of world that you want. And I just think that's so powerful. And I try and remember that. And um, my husband and I have an ongoing argument about buying organic milk. I will always buy the organic milk and he will buy the non organic milk. And I say, but I don't, you know, I, to me it doesn't really matter whether it's allegedly healthier for us or anything like that. It's the fact that I'm casting a vote for an organic system, for a slower system of farming, for a less intensive system of farming, and that's why I would choose to buy organic milk. My husband's just like, well, it's cheaper. And, you know, so it's, it's, and I think that. But that is essentially what we all need to do. We need to stop and think about what choices we're making every time we buy something. And I'm not perfect, you know, we're certainly not perfect. And um, we still have the pester power of children and living in a family, there's always going to be compromises. I I tend to think if I was, it was just me on my own, I'd probably be quite draconian and quite kind of like black and white about things. And, um, but, you know, for kids, they want crisps in their lunch and they want, you know, so there is a degree of compromise. But I think it's also really important that when we are making bigger purchases or um, sometimes the kids are ringing up about wanting something, and just having that, okay, let's just step back a minute, let's think about what kind of choices we want to make, what kind of world we want to live in, what kind of supply systems we want, and are we casting the right vote with our money? So that would be my biggest tip, and I know that that's something that probably isn't like a go out and use your reusable coffee cup, you know, because there are those, you know, if you think about plastic pollution as a bit before, there's coffee cups, there's um, water bottles, plastic straws, and shopping bags, you know, and we can all make different choices with them. Um, but I think for me, that is the core of sustainable-ish living, is just thinking as much as you can, how, what, what better choices, what different choices can I make today? Because we make thousands of choices every day, and each one of those has the potential um, to make a change. Might sound a bit corny, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I think another very corny thing is that I think actually being imperfect is very powerful. Mm. That like uh, pretending that we've got it, it's not really where we are. Yeah, uh, and it just it just kind of the, the people just understand imperfection and they relate to imperfection, mm -hmm. and I just that's what I found really interesting about your platform is that. You don't necessarily preach to convert it. Mm -hmm. So that you just kind of relate to it. I mean, that's the thing more. is that, you know, um, it's like that power of you know, small acts multiplied by mm -hmm. thousands or whatever. If we, if we, because I remember at times, while well, like, I was in the I would get overwhelmed by the sheer extent of the, you know, especially climate change and things like that. And, and I had a big kind of meltdown during that year of like, what the hell am I doing? I'm like, how can I, I possibly make any difference at all? But everybody, you know, if everybody did these small things, and they haven't, I don't think we are like the hippie family that everybody looks at and thinks we're a bit grubby at school. I think everybody, you know, we're just a normal family. Um, and if everybody made all these small changes that don't actually massively affect your lifestyle, your quality of life, but cumulatively would make a huge impact on people and planet, and that's the idea is that hopefully make it easier for everybody, then everybody can get on board. Yeah. 
the drugs smell in the ocean. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that is yeah, so yeah, fun. Yeah, the candles on the beach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then uh, that now I'm going to ask Ali. So, uh, so companies create the social media very carefully, but how we can curate our social media without being pretty and personal, mm, like personal as individuals, without without really. Like how we can influence our friends without feeling that we're preaching, yeah. or we are being patronising, or we are yeah. all about eco. <laughs> yeah. how, how, what's the balance? So I've been quite lucky really with mine. I have um, a couple of different personal accounts. I've got So Good in Every Way and Incredibly Busy. So Good in Every Way is like a curated account where uh, we have a different theme every month. Good things, <laughs> so good and great. And mine is, I'm not really sure what mine is, mine is a bit of an eclectic mix of sort of visually designed, I don't know. Anyway, it's quite pretty, it's quite nice. <laughs> but I'm really lucky because um, that gives me the flexibility. So if I am approached by a brand, for example, mm -hmm. if it's something that I'm doing particularly, um, I don't know how to word this really. So I don't do many ads on my um, Instagram. That's probably where I'm going with this, isn't it? So if I do do an ad, it tends to be for a brand that I kind of like or think are good or uh, doing something to highlight um, sustainability or workers' rights. Um, and I've generally been given kind of free reign with my own creativity to be able to... Um, what's the word? Well, to do to do it in a way where it has my style to it mm -hmm. without it, you know, being me holding something up to, to camera. Um, I don't know where I'm going with this. Uh, yeah, so I do mm -hmm. do it in a subtle way. And, and then you can do things, I suppose, like um, you can talk about sustainable Christmas, you can talk about... so. Um, Oh, I know what I was going to show you. You could talk about things like for a shiki. I don't know mm -hmm. if I'm pronouncing that right. Yeah. So doing Christmas wrapping with fabric. <laughs> Dressing one is from a carver, and uh, Bryony sent this to show you. So these are fabrics that she sells on her website. They're off cuts, which might be interesting for you. <laughs> um, and she sells these in bundles for um, Christmas wrapping. You know, I think I think they're seven pounds and. Half of that money goes to a charity. I don't know which charity this year, but so you I can do, you can talk about things like that on your social media, and you can talk about. So I recently went away to a women's retreat in Wales. You can talk about that. I think that's really lovely. And my husband is going to be giving me um, paying for me to go <laughs> in March. So yeah, that's a really nice Christmas present. So things like experiences going to the theatre. Mm. You can talk about events that you go to. You know. So, so it's more about making it make it interesting, really, rather than sustainable per se. Yeah, sort of a mixture of like a bit of humour. Yeah. Well, basically, just showing not saying it. Like, yeah. 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 <laughs> I think I, I, I often feel like I'm very guilty of not talking to friends and like real life friends and family about the things that I do because I don't want to be like that person that everyone's talking their lives at, but I would be quite vocal. Social media, but I'm then, you know, I had a whole crap free Christmas hashtag and a kind of hierarchy of, you know, buy less, um, I can't remember what's something that buy ethical and buy second hand, give gifts, give, um, give experiences, all those sorts of things. Yeah. So, and I think something like that, I will share something like that onto my personal pages because I think it's, it's just, um, it is very shareable, that it's very, everybody can take something from it and you're not kind of preaching and finger wagging. I think yeah. that's like, yeah. Something I saw today, I, I watch stories, I shouldn't probably, because it's a time <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so, um it was an influencer, who I won't name any names, she seems really lovely, and she's been, you know, she's given a shout out to lots of small brands, so that's brilliant, and I totally respect her for that, and that's been really good for them. But she was wrapping um, a Christmas hamper today on her stories, and she was holding up all these different beautiful organic products and saying, you know, the really lovely small brand she was mentioning, mentioning Cardo and, you know, lots of name dropping, but all really nice. And then she explained how she was going to fill the basket, which she bought locally from a local shop, 
with cellophane, and she had this big roll of cellophane, and I was just like, oh god. Twitching. She's like, well, just washed up all the cellophane, shoved it in, and then put all these beautiful organic products and then wrapped it in cellophane, and I was, anyway, I, I have messaged her, but she's not died. It's hard because I don't want to really piss people off, like, but, so you could be a preacher on the other, on the other foot, if you like, as a, as a viewer, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah. but that's like having consistency, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But I do think so that bit. it takes sometimes it takes just one person to say something to you for you yeah. to realise. Well, yeah, yeah. Like doing the dance. Yeah, yeah. 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 Like, so you're like, oh god, yeah. What was I thinking? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, I hope so. I mean, I probably used. I made. I made. I made Christmas um, biscuits mm. a couple of years ago. And I put them into a cellophane bag. And yeah, 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 yeah. You know, yeah. Kind of like it's a, it's a <laughs> process of learning. Like it's not yeah. like rewiring yeah. your own brain because yeah. this is what we we live in a culture that has taught us that convenience is number one and that we should all pay for that. Yeah. And that's why you mentioned those cookies. Exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, I that's on camera now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure whoever received it, Vince didn't read it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, Serena, can I mention, like, as a journalist, you are in a pretty powerful position to influence people, because people hear, well, okay, are you not? Maybe, yeah. every now and then, not? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, yeah, you write your articles, people read them, and they respond to them. So, how have you, but you write many different things, and how you apply, like, how you apply your white values to your work, and how you interact with people that read them, and then might get negative or positive in comments. So what, what is your, how, yeah, it's, it's very much about the values, that is the question, but all the I can wonder around. How yeah. do you apply your values to your work, especially okay. in Christmas? <laughs> yeah, so I guess I do write a lot of opinion um, pieces, and actually that was kind of what I always wanted to do. I've wanted to be a journalist since I was about 13, for that reason. Um, and, you know, the thing about opinion writing is that you might not always feel as strongly about what you're writing as it comes across to the reader. But to my mind, as long as I can make the reader question something, that matters more than convincing them to agree with me. So if I write an 800 word piece about, I wrote a piece last year as well about how we shouldn't send Christmas cards. Um, it was a bit kind of cynical, I suppose, and people would read it and go, oh, this killjoy, whatever. But actually, we throw away, I think it's a billion mm. Christmas cards, billion with a B, every year, okay? I read that stat and I was checking, I was like, do we even send a billion Christmas Imagine, cards? Imagine, right? Yeah. Um, so I would hope that even if someone read it and it's like, who is this bitch who's coming from my Christmas card? <laughs> they'd be like, they'd say that, they'd be like, oh my god, a billion. Okay, like that's a problem. Maybe next year I'll start reusing the Christmas cards that I get sent. Something my grandma has done forever is like she gets a Christmas card, she'll cut it out and keep the front bit and maybe stick something new on the back and do that and do that again. Do you know what somebody told me? What? Do the front bit, send it as a postcard. Yeah, or I was like, that yeah, is you can do I've that. that. I've never okay. loaded nothing. Or so. get <laughs> to the point where you know your cards like that. <laughs> you, like, really. But you know. Like, yeah, <laughs> also. Um, but yeah, I mean, if one person can question something that they haven't before, to, to me, that's job done. It's never about convincing someone to agree with me. It's about getting to question things that they've internalised. Um, and I guess that was what I was trying to do with that Christmas piece, you know. I think there are always going to be, and, and you know, you allude to this, and I've written about it, and I've spoken about it really openly, I guess shit ton of hate, mm -hmm. um, like so much, uh, particularly for certain types of pieces, not necessarily ones that you have thought, it's quite interesting, um, but I do like, I have like, I do get like death threats and yeah. like horren horrendous messages, you can't imagine it. Um, and I think, um, you know, that the people don't like to be challenged, mm -hmm. they just don't. They, don't, they see the world the way they see it, and as soon as you question that, it worries them. And we've kind of been brought up to see things in that way, from mm. even from our education system, the way that we teach children. You know, don't argue, you're too argumentative, don't answer back. I was told that, like, all throughout my childhood. That's 
really not the way that we should be educating people. Of course we should be questioning everything. Of course history books were written primarily by privileged white men. So you, things that people have presented to you as fact, you can go off and do that investigation and find out, is that fact? Or is that just part of the story? And I think the more we can encourage people to do that, the better world we'll be able to create. Yeah, questioning is, and it's, it is a challenge, because as you said, people don't want to question it, people want to hear difficult questions. Well, everything comes crumbling down. If you've built your life based on these social norms, yeah. and suddenly someone's saying, maybe you didn't have to do it that way, maybe we shouldn't do it that way, then what's happened? Like, what have you done with your life, you know? Yeah. Suddenly, it's, it, suddenly it's really scary for people. Yeah, it's uh, it's 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 kind of uh, never ending story, but it's interesting what you said that you can that job is done once people start thinking, and it's not really about it's not really about getting the applause or being on the like bad side of the story. It's more of about starting the conversation really and check you will see where it will go, even when it comes to well independent. Comment. And that I've seen, and it's pretty. It's pretty challenging. It is right. Yeah, yeah. it's pretty challenging. I'm actually quite impressed. Oh, do I read the comments? Sometimes yeah. I do. Oh. Against a better judgment. Yeah. I actually have a my favourite jacket, vintage. Don't worry. Um, and it ha I I have a lot of enamel pins on. And one of my friend gave it to me, and it's an old school computer. It says never read the comments. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think I mean I could get that tattooed, but I, I I'm a bit. I guess I'm a bit masochistic in that way. I also have a very thick skin. It takes a lot for me to actually get upset by something. Usually I just think that I feel sorry for the people, I guess, that they're wasting their time telling me that they look like me when they could be working on themselves because they don't seem to like themselves that much. Um, if they're wasting their time doing that. So I kind of see it in that way. And sometimes actually reading the comments is useful. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, because when I write an opinion piece or when I'm having a debate with someone, I want to know what they're going to come back at me mm. with so that I can have that argument prepared. And if you never interact with people who have opposing views to you, you will never be able to understand where they're coming from. And sometimes in certain aspects they're right, and you can say, do you know what, like, you're right about this, but that doesn't diminish my argument because of this. Mm. And if you never look at anything that has the opposite view to you, you'll never be able to do that. So. I try to sometimes, but for mental health, not weird. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're going to talk about togetherness and Christmas, and I just want to say, I just want to ask uh, Jen how your kids reacted to the, the, your Christmas episode. So you actually quite answered in the first question, mm. uh, but that, but then how we do some of those shopping new things influenced your family, and uh, do you feel like it did influence? Yeah. And the quality of time that you spend together is it because I've read quite a few articles about the fact that we really <coughs> shop so much and we kind of by shopping express our feelings to people mm. now that we kind of go through this whole mechanism. But once you turn back to this, is do we really need to do mm. that this way? Like yeah. what was your I I will hands up say I still really, really struggle with Christmas because I don't think it's because of this, but my mum would go bonkers and you know, we would have massive stockings and you'd come downstairs and there's like magic when you open the door and there was just presents everywhere and so although my head is telling me like the kids don't need anything else they have got I still want them to have like oh but they won't have enough to open and they're going to be really sad and they won't be kids you know and I think I slightly naively thought that you know we'd do this year by nothing new and I'd have these two complete like non-consumerist children and to a certain extent my eldest I think it's just the way he is. He's he's ten now, but he's quite. Um, he will be really. He will really think something through, really agonise over decisions, especially if he's got to spend his own money over buying something. Um, my youngest is just like, I want that, I want that, I want that, I want that, I want that. Like, we go to the supermarket and have a meltdown because he wants a magazine. Like, it's um, so it is. It is really hard. And I mean, a couple of years ago, I wrote a piece for the Daily Mail, um, talking about not preaching to the converted, about you know we weren't. I think they, they pegged it as we weren't buying anything for our kids for Christmas, and we were, but we were buying them like second-hand stuff. Um, and yeah, I've got people saying, like, you're so cruel, and, and you know, your kids are going to be bullied, and do they not compare gifts when they go out for Christmas? And I don't think the kids do. I don't think that they go back and go, what did you 
what do you get for Christmas? And I got three iPads, and what did you get? And, but it's still a, it is still a work in progress for us, I think, and for me. Um, my head wants one thing, and my heart is still kind of like, oh, I really want it to be magical and lovely. One of the things we've done is that um, for an advent calendar, um, instead of them getting like a chocolate or a thing each day, um, there's a little message in the drawer, and it will say things like make mince pies or um, make Christmas cards or write your Christmas cards or go to the pantomime or you know, and, and the idea that started when they were preschoolers and we had a bit more time to do these kinds of things, but that it was trying to shift the focus a little bit from things to experiences and to time spent together. And I think I think you're exactly right in that we are brought up with this societal norm of what Christmas should be. And actually that year I think it was the first time I stopped and thought, what what do I want our Christmas to be? What do I want it to mean for us? Like we're not religious, so why are we doing Christmas? But why how do we want our Christmases to be, rather than just doing Christmas how we've always done Christmas because that's how you do Christmas, and um, actually stopping and thinking about how we want it to be and trying to manage, I guess, the kids' expectations because if they have mountains of presents each year and then suddenly the next year they're like, oh, no presents, that's, you know, you have to kind of wean them onto it, I think, and, and to, to wean it down slowly um, so that you've got them on board and so their expectations how we set up Christmas. Like anyone who's had kids will know that like the first Christmas, they're completely oblivious. They're like, open this, open this, open this. And they're just like, they would quite happily sit there and just tear the wrapping paper up, but we kind of condition them to keep and then and then three years old we're whinging at them for the fact that they're just grabbing the next present and discarding it. And it, you know it's it's it is so normal that we this overconsumption, this um, excess is completely normal at Christmas and it's it's hard to to, to challenge that, to push back on that, I think. Um, but it, it's interesting what you said, though, shifting from like buying experience to the life experience, because that's actually the whole part of the market that now is being established. We still, like shift from buying things to renting things, which is a mm. little, which is, it, which is Christmas the, trees. Christmas yeah. trees, yeah. clothing, many things. So actually shifting from buying to providing a new experience, yeah. as you said, baking instead of buying something yeah. like, that you can do with the family, or having the calendar with task rather yeah. than things. It's it's it is it is whole whole new thing that is really I can really see happening within society. Mm. So it, that's what's happening here yeah. with you at a home level, but if we look at the market, it is really happening, isn't it? I wrote, I wrote this down because I've always to forget. Uh, the four word guideline the want, need, where, mm. yeah, 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 yeah. Has anyone ever done that? But some people will do that because they know something they want, something they need, something they want to wear, and something they need. But the other thing I find is that, like, like we get our kids stockings and they're what's from Father Christmas. But if we let them walk them, the other presents they get are probably from other members of the family, so we tend to buy them an experience. So this year they won't be watching the live stream. <laughs> We didn't even talk to robot wars, which unless you've got children in a certain age will be nothing to you. But um, you know, we've done things like sleep over the natural history museum, we've done like owl handling days. Mm -hmm. So they don't get like physically a present to open from us. Um, you know, and I think we were giving them four presents that weren't in their stockings. That would feel like quite a lot. Um, but I think because my mum isn't around anymore to buy this amount of presents for them, it seems much more noticeable. But yeah, I think having some kind of structure to hang your present giving there is quite useful. If I can just say, I mean, I don't have kids, um, but uh, over the course, this is a stat I found out recently, over the course of a lifetime, people spend £54,000 on Christmas presents. Really? £54,000. Mm. Now, I don't know, yes, it's true that kids, I don't think that kids are innately consumerist, but I think kids innately want to fit in, right? So we have a film industry and a TV industry and an advertising industry that is pushing a certain type of Christmas on children and they see that and that is what they expect. They also want to go to school and be completely normal and as undifferent as it's possible to be. The truth is no kid is that. Everyone is a unique individual and the sooner you can learn to embrace that, I think the better. Obviously, I, I don't think I'm not trying to make a value judgment on how people treat their kids, but
But I do think that perhaps we sometimes, and I say this as someone with a very young brother, okay, so I do have like a small child in my life who I don't want to like upset or get bullied, but I do think that actually the sooner we can teach kids that what you see around you isn't the only way to be, the better, because that's how we're going to eventually have a generation. I think you see it now with um, people younger than me, sort of the post-millennial sort of 16 to 22 age bracket um, that are mega woke and very cool. So <laughs> <you're aware. laughs> I'm sorry. Um, you know, you're seeing them start to actually embrace individuality and embrace questioning social norms. And I think actually, you know, as parents, people desperately want to protect their children from anything that's going to make them upset. But sometimes you kind of need to create that point of difference to create that character that will eventually, I think, lead to a better world for all of us. If that doesn't sound too judgmental, I, I know it's a tricky thing to say because I don't have kids, but I do think it's just kind of a counterpoint to something I think about. Like, if you do have kids and you're like, oh no, like, I can't buy them these amazing toys for Christmas. Like, there can be a positive and the opposite as well, I think. Um, we thought we're talking about social media with companies, but also the private ones, but is it not really Christmas? Are they not really going to turn off your phone? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, how many small business people are here on their own business? So, hi. <laughs> um, so, I, I would recommend, I mean, we've also had Christmases already within your small business period, um, of putting some sort of scheduled post saying, you know, seasons, greetings, I'm, you know, and this is when I'm open until, and don't expect people, don't expect people to expect that you're going to reply to them on Boxing Day if you're, you know, you're, you're shut. I mean, it's really tempting to take pictures mm -hmm. of, uh, Christmas. Christmas pudding, or I don't know, I'm, I'm going to try and be present. Mm. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> but so uh, yeah, scheduled posts. Yeah, it's challenging, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and we're going to finish with Siri now. So, uh, do you think Christmas celebration actually motivates people to be together all day, as you said before? Uh, create unnecessary pressure, and as I've probably answered my question by asking it. I mean, but, uh, yes, it makes people be together. Do they want to be together though? Is that the best use of their time? <laughs> yes, it is. It's their family. Um, I, I, genuinely, I know it sounds that, like I'm trying to be, you know, facetious, but I'm not. I, I mean that genuinely. And so how would you re like to finish up? How would you reimagine it? What what is the what is important in Christmas to keep? Nothing. <laughs> Honestly, the bank holiday. <laughs> the bank holiday. I really strongly I think crackers. <laughs> Make your own. Yeah. Why can't you have them for any other time of the year? Yeah, yeah okay, we'll have December crackers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I really, I feel really strongly that, and that I'm not saying that no one should be allowed to celebrate it, mm. to clarify. Look at Easter, for example. Easter is not a huge cultural deal. Some people will do, like, Easter egg hunts, and that's cool, that's nice for kids, like, fine. There's a bank holiday, but there isn't a social pressure to act a certain way and have a particular type of day. The whole country doesn't shut down in order to facilitate that for the people who are privileged enough to do it. That's not the way it functions. And that's the way I see Christmas. If you're someone who feels passionately about it, you can celebrate it. But I don't think that the entire society should revolve around the minority who want to experience it in a certain way. So with that, we're going to open to questions. It's only for UK, but it's not true for Italy, for example, it's it sat down, please, too. Spain probably, because of the religion, the cultural stuff you're mentioning. So all things are just assumptions based on culture, I guess. Um, although we don't expect people like uh, Muslims to walk on Ramadan. It's a big deal for them. Mm -hmm. You can't ask them to start doing that, obviously. Um, so the, the, whole, the whole thing about uh, Christmas. Um, and, and I would say, I think that your you know, points around social norms, I mean, I think we're looking at cultural norms. I think social norms is too generic. It, it's, uh, it's, I don't find it a useful 
way to talk about like the festivals that bring people together. Well, that well, by social, by social norms, I'm reporting. I'm, I'm referring to the society that we're currently in. Right. So obviously, yeah. not the entire globe. Um, I don't know. I, I grew up in Spain. Um, Christmas is perceived differently. Uh, it's not on Christmas Day. It's on Christmas Eve. I know it's the same in a lot of countries around Europe. Um, but there is still a big, at least in Spain, I can't really speak for Italy or Greece, but there is still a huge amount of pressure on the festival itself, right? So that time of year itself. On Easter in Spain, which is a Catholic country, uh, there are bank holidays, two of them, but there isn't a whole industry of media based around telling you how you should spend it. And I think that's where the different lies, difference lies. I think in the UK particularly, because we consume so much US media because of the common language as well, um, there's kind of an additional level to that because we are sharing that media with a country that kind of pumps a lot of that consumer attitude out towards us. Um, I do know that in different cultures, things are perceived differently. Uh, broadly, I would say that no one holiday should be so revered by a specific society that it excludes people that don't celebrate it. So within Western society, particularly anglicised Western society, I believe that to be Christmas, and, and that's where my issue is. But that's not to say that I wouldn't have a similar view for other cultural equivalents. that makes sense? Do we have a... Do you have any? Uh, uh, is that? Do we have any other questions for? Yeah. Um, do you not think that perhaps this consumerism is really an issue of the heart? It's a bit greed, really, because we're, you know, we're wanting so much, and isn't that the issue rather than the fact that we have to change the way we consume? Um, isn't it just that we're consuming so much, and there's just so much desire in our society to buy? Just not, it's just not never enough, and it just continues. Yeah, I mean, I think some of that desire is driven by the media and the advertising industry. It's quite interesting. My kids um, they don't watch masses of telly when they do it, it's something that's um, you know recorded or it's a DVD or something, so they don't really watch adverts. And then when we go to the cinema, they're like, Whoa, you know, and like my youngest, like, Mommy, can I have this, 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 this. And it's just really interesting, and, and, and I, I was away the other weekend and, and had to kind of sit and watch normal telly, and I was like, oh my god, these ads are just, you know, you're not consciously, you know, you're just unconsciously kind of consuming that and taking that on. Of course you're going to want more. Like, I was sat there watching, like, whoa, did people actually buy into this? People really want, think that they need this and need that, and that's going to make their life better. But it becomes so normal, and we've been led to believe that more is better, that excess is good and normal, that that's kind of what we buy into. And as we say, when you start to sort of challenge that, it is really hard to sort of push back against that status quo, I think. Um, and we just, we just don't really question our consumption anymore. We don't mm. question our desire. But do we have to then just change our economy, the way the economy runs? Yes. Capitalism. Yes. That's the answer to everything. <laughs> it's a problem with the <laughs> Uh, I've got a question here. I guess, it's, yeah. Um, I was going to say, um, to be honest, sustainable Christmas doesn't get the best sales pitch in the world. <laughs> um, yeah. But why is that? Because we never ever speak about the benefit, right? Uh, sustainability potentially could unlock, what do they say, 12 trillion, uh, with potentially 48 trillion. But why do we not speak about, you know, sort of creativity that we, 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 we get at as a result of being sustainable? Why do we not talk about, you know, sort of the lack of stress, you don't have to queue, you don't have to deal with all these crazy expectations and family. Why don't we talk about money saved? Why do we not push this as the narrative? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. <laughs> um, I mean, one of the most common questions I got asked, you know, was how much, did, how much money did you save during your year by having you? And it probably was about £2,000. And that wasn't through, that wasn't the primary reason we did that. That was just, uh, on my husband's part, a happy byproduct. You know, he was um, one of the reasons he stuck with it, I think. But... Yeah, I think, um, you know, I work really hard to, to talk about, um, you know, the time that you'll save, the stress that you won't have to face the crowds at the Christmas shopping and all that sort of thing. Um, I know there were lots of people 
people highlighting the green jobs and the green economy and all that sort of yeah. thing. I don't know, sometimes people just don't don't want to hear that there. So this is how I do Christmas, this is how Christmas is. I don't know. I think it is a really challenging thing to There's a lot of debt that comes with Christmas. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Martin Lewis, I don't know if you've seen that, yeah. he's doing that mm-hmm. Martin present pact or whatever and you know, his his argument for it is that people get into under pressure to get into debt. Um, but actually, you know, you put on the planet for a massive amount of pressure to supply all this stuff as well. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it is about the time that we took a stand and just kind of said no, but it is really hard to have those conversations with, uh, lots of people have said to me, I've tried to have that conversation with the mother-in-law or with um, my uh, sister-in-law and they just carry on buying regardless of being home being me. Do you know, so it, it's really hard. I think that's, I mean, I, I would say that, uh, to your point, we have um, been indoctrinated to believe that spending money on someone is a way to show yeah, you care yeah, about them. Yeah. And that is what capitalism has created for us. <laughs> yeah. Spending money on yourself is self-love, and spending money on someone else just shows you care. Well, it doesn't. It shows that you are willing to give your money to corporations and rich people and ivory towers who are like, yes! And, you know, we can't flip that switch that easily. That is still what people believe. So yes, with your husband, your children, even your parents, you might be able to. When it comes to broader society, it's very difficult to say, oh, well, I'm not buying you a gift, but I'm, I'm not being stingy. It's because I'm being sustainable. It becomes really difficult. I personally find, I don't know if you guys have found this, but try not to say guys. It's not, it, it's actually like an issue with women and, and male dominance and whatever. Sorry. I don't know if you ladies have found this, but um, <laughs> when I hand make something or, or give a gift that isn't bought, I end up spending so much more money on it. <laughs> like, almost intentionally. Because it's like, no, I swear I'm not being stingy. Yeah. Like, I don't know if, and, and I think that is part of it. It's like the perception of not wanting to be perceived in that way because that is what we've been told it means. Mm. make things, I don't know, maybe I'm just living in this little woolly world, when you make things you put so much of yourself into it and so much time and effort, Yeah, that, that should be the perception. And, and the, what you were saying, so we've got teenage boys and they really do get this whole thing apart from not buying on Depop, which mm. I'm trying to persuade them to. They, they're selling their old toys on eBay and they're, you know, they've both got buy second hand bikes from eBay for Christmas in September. So they've had their big present because they both needed bikes in September when they started a new year at school and they're massively tall now to be for their bikes. Um, so they know they've had their big present and then they're tall enough now not to expect an equally large gift yes. at Christmas. And we're do- going to do that in the Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which was quite amusing talking about that today, about chocolate. <laughs> the so, yeah, chocolate. That's, that's worked for me. Yeah. I can read the book and yeah, yeah, yeah. I want it. I need it. it. <laughs> I can I read wear it. <laughs> wear it. <laughs> Do we have any other questions here? Can I, can I say something? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Bryony at Palava said uh, that I could give one of these packs away. So I have to think of a question. I couldn't think of one. Um, what uh, are Pozu's shoe soles made from? If you'd like to, me to, if you'd like one of these, can you remember what the shoes are made from? Their soles. Coconut has. Oh, who said that first? I think it was you. Yeah. <laughs> 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 really? Very nice. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for being. I know. And uh, yeah.